Good morning and welcome to Kennesaw Family Life Church online services. We're so glad that you were able to join us online this morning, but if it's maybe your first time here, we want to take a moment and kind of show you the screen a little bit. So I'm going to send it back into the past with Jocelyn and I as we give you the tour. <laughs> All right. And I hope Robbie includes the yay. It's been a brand, it's a brand new year, so it's a brand new tour. Woohoo! Although we're going to go through it really fast for you. If you've never been here before, we want to introduce you to the platform just a little bit. The wide world. So platform. over here or down here if you're on your mobile device, mm -hmm. there is a chat. Chat. That yes. is correct for 100 points. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. A chat window. Please, please take a moment to say hello in mm -hmm. the chat so that we know you're here and can greet you in mm -hmm. real time. Exactly. And then we also have tabs within the chat. So there's the chat tab, which you'll start out on. We also have a Bible tab available. So mm -hmm. if you want to look up and follow along with the sermon and stuff. It's pretty much your version is on that Bible tab, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the notes tab, which is very handy dandy if, again, you want to follow along. But you cannot print those if you would like to print your notes. You can go up to the top of the screen here. And on the, the you see some buttons at the top of the screen. You can go to our website. And right at the very top of the website, you'll see a little PDF guy. And uh, you can click on that. It opens up a PDF with printable notes. All right. So there you go. Um, that, is, that is the notes button up there. There's also some more buttons up here. We have mm. our giving button. Indeed. Uh, if you want to give as your form of worship with your tithes and offerings, mm -hmm. um, you click on that. It takes you right to the website. Super quick. It really is. And it's even quicker, like once you've done it once, it's like no time at all. <laughs> you just like put how much you want to give, click, that's good. Boom. We also have our volunteer opportunities up there. Mm -hmm. So the volunteer button, and that's mostly the waiver that you For sign forever fed, to yeah. forever fed. Yeah. There's, uh, there's other things. If you've never been to our brand new website, I don't know if you know, we redid the website. It's fancy. Uh, it's got lots of stuff on there for you. You can check it out while you're over in those buttons. It'll open a new window and you can have the website open too. So mm -hmm. that's the, the yeah. And we're back to real time. Again, good morning and thanks for joining us today. Every week we try and get to know each other a little bit better. We are a church family, so we wanna know people in our family. Um, so we always ask a question, kind of a get to know you better, like what's your opinion on things kind of question. This week, I'm thinking since it's summer now, we're going to ask a summer question. So I want you to think back to when you were in school. You still lived at your parents' house. You were going to school and you got summer break. It was a big deal. No school for like two, three months, depending on how old you are. <laughs> um, so what was your favorite thing to do during summer vacation from school. So take a couple minutes, talk about it in the chat, and we'll be right back.
And we're back. Did you take a couple minutes and talk about it over in the chat? I hope so. I hope you got to know somebody a little bit better because of it. For me, I think looking back at summer break from school, I mean, there was stuff that I like to do around the house with my friends. We go bike riding and things like that. But my favorite part was always when mom and dad would announce that we're going to Disney World. <laughs> that was like, I have, we didn't do it every summer, obviously. We weren't like rich people, but we would go several times during my childhood and it was always a favorite. I loved going to Disney World and getting to see the parks. Um, the parks have grown since then and changed since then, but it was always like my favorite thing that we would do during my summer break. So that's it for me. Uh, I hope you had a chance to say something in the chat. If not, go ahead and say it now, but listen up because I'm going to tell you where you can get connected this week. God doesn't ever want us to do life all by ourselves. So we like to provide opportunities where we can just meet together and get into groups, whether that be studying the Bible together or just hanging out and encouraging one another. So what can you do this week? Well, Monday through Thursday, that's tomorrow, through Thursday, every morning on Zoom only, we have our prayer time together. We start our day at 7.14 in the morning. Um, I do a quick devotion usually. Pastor Larry usually says prayer over all the needs that we have. And it's a great way to start the day just being able to be with your church family and praying. So join us on that. If you've never tried it, just Come on along. We'll text you the password to get into Zoom. Um, it's really a good time together. Uh, then we have Wednesday night at desktop where we meet for church. Uh, at 6.30, we're going to meet for the women's Bible study. We've been going over the names of God. Right now we're talking about some of the names of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. So... Join us. Uh, we're probably going to meet in Pastor Larry's office, 6.30 to 8 p.m. Um, if you need directions or if you need any instructions, just let me know. I'm happy to give them out and see you there. Um, then Thursday morning, the following morning, uh, the men have their weekly get-together at Honeysuckle Biscuit and Bakery. That is at 7.30 right after prayer. And um, they... You know, it's not a Bible study, so don't feel like you have to bring stuff. It's just a time to get to know each other and encourage each other. So if you're a guy and you haven't tried going yet, come along. See what they do. Have some coffee and some baked goods. Because <laughs> I'm pretty sure they sell both at Honeysuckle. So uh, then Thursday night is our monthly game night for the youth group at my house. So if you're a teen or you know one, let them know we're going to be hanging out. We play multitudes of games. Sometimes we play video games, Jackbox games, board games, card games, whatever games everybody's up to playing. So join us for that. That's from 6.30 to 8.30, again, at my house. Hopefully we'll see you there. And then Saturday. Saturday is the summer movie series that Kennesaw Parks and Rec puts on every year. Um, this is the last one. It starts at 6, and then it goes till the movie's over. Um, usually the movie starts somewhere in the 8.30ish mark. It's just whenever it gets dark, that's when they start the movie. But from 6 o'clock up until then, there's booths and there's games for the kids. You can find a place on the lawn to set up and just enjoy being outside together. So, hey, come and join us. <laughs> Um, I'll be there at one of the booths. Uh, you can come by and see me and say hello. Pastor Larry is always doing the emceeing for the games and all of that. So we'll definitely be there and we hope to see you there too. Come out and get some notes, some people from our Kennesaw community. And that's where you can get connected this week. Don't forget we have our church game night and our Forever Fed Outreach coming up soon too. That's going to be, I'll announce those next week, but you can always check the church calendar on our website on the This Month page. So 
that's where you can get connected. We hope to see you at something this month. I'm enjoying having you guys join us online. I'm the one that's hosting, so I know I get up and down to go lead worship and come back, but know that you can always click on the buttons to talk in a private window or just join us in the chat. And we are happy to get to know you better and to pray for you. So speaking of prayer, let's do that together before we move on to the rest of our service. Um, we have uh, our worship coming up with our music and also the message Pastor Larry has to bring for us today. Um, if you'd like to give in the offering, don't forget, you can always do that through the giving link up there at the top of the screen on our website page. So that is another way we can express our worship to God through giving. So let's pray together and just ask God to speak to our hearts today. Open up your mind to hear what he has to say to you this morning. Let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful for who you are and all you've done for me. God, you've provided a way. You've provided my needs. You've given me salvation. Lord, you give me forgiveness and grace and mercy. And I thank you for that. Lord, I come together with every person that's online this morning. And Lord, we just lift you up in this place. Wherever we're sitting, wherever we're at, Lord, we lift you up together. Lord, as we begin to sing your praises through our music, may you be glorified. Lord, open our hearts, open our minds, and open our ears to hear from you as we're on this service today. Give us more of you, O oh God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship him with our music. Oh Lord, we are so thankful. Thankful for everything that you've done for us. We lift you up this morning together. As we sing and as we praise you, Lord, draw close to us. Pour your spirit out over us. Blessed be your name this morning. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, for the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be a glorious name. Blessed be your name, when the sun shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, on the road marked with suffering, for this pain. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name.
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Blessed be your name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name.
for you are a God. You are Lord over all. And you deserve all of our praise and all of our worship. search the world Nothing better than you. 
give you all of our praise, O oh Lord. There is truly nothing in our lives better than you. And we praise you this morning. take the next few minutes of our time to pray over the needs of our church. It's something we do every week. So if you're new with us, we come in and we pray one for another. That's what scripture tells us to do is to pray for each other. So we're going to take a few minutes right now and pray over the needs of our church. We're going to pray over physical needs, emotional needs, financial needs, whatever we have. And if you have a need, please click that prayer button down at the bottom or you can put it in chat if you feel comfortable. But that will allow us to add your need to the prayer list or to pray with you on those things. We're going to pray very generically over all of these issues. We, we won't be able to get everybody's needs in right now as far as individually. But we do on our prayer time throughout the week do specifically by name call out those needs. We also want to pray over our offering today. Thank you so much for being faithful in your giving. It is a part of our worship. It's a part of what God has asked us to do in worship, to give our first fruits. We want to continue to be faithful in that. We also want to pray for our community, uh, the city, our first responders, and also our community partners, which this month happen to be Relocal Real Estate. We're going to pray over their family and, and the, the, all the agents that work there. We're also going to pray over LifeBridge Church, which is just down the road from us. We're going to pray that God's blessings will be upon them. And then we're also going to pray for Jonathan and Bonnie Cooper, their daughter Bethany. They serve in Springfield, Missouri, but on the world mission side, they've been all over the world, but they serve in helping pastors and ministers and really just ministries all over the world with video and production to help share the gospel everywhere they possibly can. So we want to lift them up and, and pray over them today. So let's join together in prayer. Father, we are so grateful to be in your presence. We're grateful that you love us right where we are. Father, I ask right now that you would meet the needs of this body. Lord, for those that are battling with physical needs, we pray right now that you would bring healing. We pray that you'd bring healing over diabetes, bring healing over high cholesterol, bring healing over cancer. Lord, healing over emotional hurts. Lord, anxiety, fear, depression, Lord, those deep wounds that go, that are there, protect our minds. Father, we pray that you would touch us physically and emotionally today, that we would be in your hands, that we would be healed by you. And Lord, I pray over our loved ones that are struggling as well. Father, we ask that you would meet every need that's there. Pray over our finances. Help us to be good stewards of what you provided for us. For those that are struggling right now financially, Lord, I pray that you would provide. I pray that you give opportunities. Help us to be good stewards. Help us to use that money wisely. To give the first fruits in our tithe and offering, Lord, you bless that. And Lord, we ask that that money would go to serve this community. Lord, we thank you for where you've placed us today. We pray over our city, the first responders, our mayor, the city council. We ask right now that you would bless them, protect them, guide them. And Father, I ask that you would be with our community partners today. I pray for over Relocal Real Estate. Bless them, meet every need that's there. We lift up LifeBridge Church. Father, I pray that lives would be touched and changed in their service this morning. And then we also ask that you would be with the Cooper family. Meet every financial need, physical need, spiritual need that they have. Lord, help them to do the ministry that you've called them to do. And Lord, we thank you for how you've blessed us. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. And we expect you to help us to grow and to draw closer to you today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, good morning and welcome to part four of our journey through the letter that we know as 1 Peter. We know that Peter wrote this, and Peter was one of the closest disciples to Jesus. He was kind of that lead guy of the 12, it, it would seem like. When you look at Scripture, Peter, James, and John, it was always Jesus kind of correcting Peter, and Peter was this hothead that would do things uh, without thinking, cut off people's ears, but yet he would get out of the boat and walk on water. He was just this kind of go-for-it guy, probably a type A personality. But Peter went on after Jesus uh, was crucified and then rose again. Peter went on to be the leader of the church among the Jews. He was kind of the person that everybody looked towards. And so Peter wrote this book during a time when the church was being persecuted by Nero. Emperor worship was on the rise, having the, the emperor and people were pushing towards worshiping the emperor almost like they're a god themselves or as a god. And so it was kind of this weird time, and the church was being persecuted. And, and Peter wrote this letter, we entitled this entire series, Eternal Perspectives, because Peter wrote this letter to keep things in mind with eternity, that this life isn't all that there is, that we're going to go through struggles, we're going to go through difficulties, and we need to keep everything in the right perspective. So we've been kind of working through that. Today we're going to talk about authority a little bit. And the first thing that came to mind when I talked about authority was, I fight authority and authority always wins. Do you know the lyrics to that song? Do you know who wrote that song? That was John Mellencamp wrote that song and it just runs through my head every time I think of this. And I will not sing it for you. It would not be pretty. You'd probably turn off the video, mute the TV, miss something else. But there is something within our human nature, that fallen brokenness that comes from sin, that automatically many of us fight against authority. We fight against, you know, kind of that, that resistance, that tension between what somebody's telling us to do and what we want to do. And we often think we're right or justified in the way that we feel or think. And so we fight or butt up against authority. Uh, I'm... I'm a part of Gen X. If you, the reputation of Gen Xers was just this disgruntled group of people that always resisted authority. So I kind of grew up in that, that generation that was fighting against authority all the time. Well, I want you to think of something. I mentioned to you that this was a time when Nero was persecuting the church. There was emperor worship happening. This would be the prime time for Peter as the leader of the believers, as the, the leader of the Christians, to badmouth Nero, to talk about how horrible he is and how horrible it is to, to worship the emperor and how that goes against God. But instead, Peter tells us that we need to respect authority. Peter has every reason to fight against authority, to raise up a revolt, to write something quite different than he does. But let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, where this, this is actually going to be a two-part uh, series. We're going to continue in authority next week, but from a different perspective. But right now, uh, 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17, let's look at that together. It says, For the Lord's sake, submit to all human authority. Whether the king as head of state or the officials he has appointed, for the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do right. It is God's will that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. For you are free, yet you are God's slaves. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Respect everyone and love the family of believers, fear God, and respect the king. Now again, Peter had every reason to tell believers to rise up against the king. And yet what he tells us to do, I believe through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that's why it's in Scripture, that we need to respect authority. Man, that may be hard for us to wrap our minds around. Well, the first point today is we're all subject to authority. 
Every single one of us. We're obviously under God's authority, but there are always going to be authorities over us. We're all subject to authority. I've mentioned this before. Maybe you're familiar with the festival that happens out in the desert uh, called Burning Man. Burning Man was this, this festival that was created for people to come together where there would be no rules. Anything goes. Man, if you want to run around naked, go for it. If you want to go over there and do drugs, go for it. Whatever it was, whatever you wanted to do, it was supposed to be this place of just total freedom. Freedom for all authority. The funny thing is, is that the creators of Burning Man, after one or two years of doing it, quickly found out that they had to have rules in place or people would get hurt and things would get out of hand. So Burning Man, this festival that was designed, they'd put a big, big, like, I don't know, wooden man out in the, like, you know, 50, 60 feet tall, and they would light it on fire. That's why they call it Burning Man. But they would do that, and they found out that they had to have these rules in place. So this festival that was celebrating no rules ended up having to put rules in place for the safety of the people that were there. There's always has to be authority. There always has to be a place that defines what's right and wrong and what's going on in a society. Now think about it. Um, many of us, you know, I, I hear people all the time, and Christians have been really bad about this over the last you know, 10, 15, 20 years, really even recent history, uh, embarrassingly so, about politics. We have gotten so loud about politics and who should vote for who and all of these things and, and the things that have come out of people's mouths and the anger and all of that stuff over the political landscape of our country and some people using it in the name of God that we should be angry about certain things, which, yes, there are things that the government does that, and, and certain people want to do that do go against Scripture, but we've approached it from a way that makes us look angry and actually pushes people away and causes greater division. I don't care which political party you follow. I don't care about any of those things. But you see how it has filtered into the church and created division, not only between us and people outside of the church, but within the church as well. And that's not of God. That's not of God is all. So think about it. You can tell how somebody's politically bent by the things they say, the things they post on social media, all of those things. And really, Peter has given us kind of a little different rundown, a little different playbook as Christians and how we should handle political things, how we should handle authority, whether it's in our workplace, in our homes, uh, with our government. Peter is showing us that we have a different way to follow, really to follow the path of Jesus when it comes to these things. We are fortunate enough to live in a country that allows us to choose our leaders. That's a privilege. We live in a country that allows us to choose our leaders. That's a privilege that much of the world doesn't have. I remember a few years ago when I was in Haiti, we couldn't walk around in the parks without being in a group together because there was violence happening because there was a, it was a political season. There was, they were trying to get people elected. There was power struggles and, and there were violent things happening. And, and that really, I think it breaks the heart of God. It definitely breaks my heart to see that. But we live in a, priv we live in a country that we're privileged to, to choose our leaders, which, which means that we have the right to say who we want to be but here's the thing, we're not there to slander and tear people apart. We vote on how we pray and, and where we feel God's leading us and the ones that we think are going to represent us well, that's, that's what we should do. But we're not there to tear people apart. Now look, we're all subject to authority, none of us exempt. Look at verse 13, it says, For the Lord's sake submit to all human authority, whether the king is head of state, or, and it goes on to the officials in verse 14. Why do we submit to authority? The very first words, for the Lord's sake. What does that mean? What does it mean for the Lord's sake? That's kind of a, a generic term. 
But really what it comes down to is that we are representing Jesus. We are Christians, means to be Christ-like, we're to represent Him well. And so when we respect and submit the authority that's over us, we're representing God well. We're showing what it means to be a Christian, to follow and to understand authority. Jesus submitted himself to authority, even to the point of being crucified. At any moment, being fully God and fully man, he could have taken himself out of that situation. But he submitted to that authority. Remember when the, the, the Pharisees tried to trap him and ask, you know, about paying taxes? Because they were all, man, it was this budding between the, the religious and and the king and the Roman rule, because they were under Roman rule. Remember, Israel was no longer ruling themselves. They had come under Rome. And they said, you know, who should we pay taxes to? Or should we pay taxes to Caesar? And Jesus said, hey, whose image is on the coin? Caesar's? We'll give to Caesar what's Caesar's. That's coming under that authority, that respecting of that authority. Whether you like it or not, we live under authority. We don't always have to agree with it, but we live under authority. So we need to represent Jesus well. In in doing so, we bring honor to his name. That's why we have to be careful about what we post on social media. That's why we have to be careful about how we represent ourselves. You know, this is the most I talk about politics, but it, it really comes into that authority thing. I don't promote a particular political party because as a pastor, I don't think I need to push in one way or another because I don't, I want to be able to speak and communicate to all people. Now, do I vote? Absolutely. Do I vote uh, based on what I believe and based on what I see happening? Absolutely. I pray over who I vote for and then whoever's elected, I pray over them as well. So that's a part of that process. You have an opinion. You have a right to vote. You need to do that. But treat and do things with respect. Be more about what you're for and less about what you're against. Instead of tearing people down, explain, if you want to talk about politics, explain why you're voting for this person. Here's why. This is what I love about them. This is what I see them doing. This is why I think it's going to be better for us rather than ripping apart another person. That's not Christ-like at all. So I want to keep that in perspective. Look at Romans chapter 13. This is what Paul said. We tend to go back and forth between Peter and Paul. And Romans 13, 1 and 2, Everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. Those are pretty strong words. Look, he's saying that all authority comes from God, which leads to our next point. That's actually point two. All authority comes from God. This is a hard one for us to wrap our heads around. Because you have people like Hitler and Stalin and these different ones that did great atrocities in the world. All throughout history, there have been leaders that have made really poor decisions, done things that did not honor God. And yet it's saying that God, all authority comes from God. Well, what does that mean? When I think about this, I think, of, look, God does not want somebody to do evil. God does not want these atrocities to happen. But yet he gave man free will. He allows us to have authority. People come into power. If you study the book of Kings or the books of Kings, if you go back through the history of Israel, it's a hard thing for a lot of people to wrap their heads around, especially new believers. I usually say, hey, let's, let's stay away from the Old Testament for a little while until we have an understanding of who God is through Jesus. Because you can look through the Old Testament, it's a very violent time. It's a very different time than we live in now. Matter of fact, the kings 
would go to war together. There was like a, it's almost like football season. There was a season of the year that the kings would war against each other. Kind of a strange concept. It was a very bloody and violent time. And you look through the history of Israel. God was their king. He had the judges. And Israel wanted a king. They wanted Saul. Well, they didn't, didn't know Saul at the time, but they, they complained and said, hey, I want a king. If you ever want to look at it in 1 Samuel, Samuel was the last judge to rule over Israel before there was king, before King Saul came along. And God told him, look, you don't really want a king because this is what a king's going to do to you. A king's going to tax you. He's going to make you go to war. He's going to do all of these things. But they said, yeah, we want a king anyway. And when you go throughout from that point on in Israel's history, you see kings that did right in the eyes of God, and you see kings that did evil in the eyes of God. Yet God allowed those kings to rise up. He even promised that David's family would rule on that throne. So when you're looking at these stories and you're looking at them, you see how God allows that authority to happen. And then God is the one that can remove them from that. And He does oftentimes. I don't know why God allows some people to rule and why He doesn't. I just have to trust that God's in control. My job as a believer is to respect the authority that I'm put under. To live in such a way that I honor God with my life, with my life even in the midst of difficulty. I will never know why God allows certain people to become rulers. I don't know. Maybe one day we'll understand when we get to heaven and those things will be made clear to us. I probably won't even care at that point. But I just don't know. God, God is ultimately the one that judges each one of us and the decisions that we've made. Look at 1 Timothy Chapter 2, verses 1-4, through four, it says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by goodness and dignity. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and understand the truth. Paul just told us to pray and intercede on behalf of kings and those who are in authority. How many of you who are resistant to our current president pray for him? Seriously, how many of you pray for him? How many of you pray that God's blessing would be upon him that he would follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. God can change anyone's life. God can use anyone, even bad kings. You look, study the history of Israel. God took kings that were horrible people and used them for his purposes. God's, he knows everything. He sees a bigger picture. He understands things from that eternal perspective. So do you pray for the leaders that are over you? Man, if you're in a situation where you have a boss that's really rough, do you pray for your boss, whether you like him or not? Do you pray for the people that are in authority over you? See, when we act and do things in that manner, we represent God well. We represent Jesus in what we're doing and how we're acting and how we live then we're showing people the love of God. I love that Paul encourages us to pray for our leaders, especially the ones that we disagree with. God wants them to follow Him as well. God wants them to have that supernatural experience, to know Him. Remember, He wants all to be saved. So the third thing, the reason that we're to do these things is to silence the foolish and, and that may sound a little weird. If you look at verse 15, it says, It is God's will that, you, that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. 
Sometimes people come against you for no reason. Sometimes there's just conflict. And, and, and sometimes it's just because you're a Christian. There are some people in the world that hate you just because you're a Christian. Oftentimes for no reasons or because Christians have treated them with disdain in the past. But for whatever reason, there are going to be people that don't like us. There are going to be people that are going to persecute us, whether it's our authority or people around us. And they might judge us by the actions of others, but not by our own, just because we're a Christian. So how do we handle that? When we're in the midst of difficulties and persecution, when we pray for those that come against us, we honor God with our actions, and it will silence those who persecute us. That's what he means, silencing the foolish. When somebody's coming against us, when somebody's just tearing us apart, when we love them and pray over them, and I mean sincerely pray over them, and treat them with love and respect, they have no power left in our lives. It silences them. I'm not talking about being self-righteous. That's what usually we do. We, we act like we're so much better than everybody else and that you need to be like us, like us perfect Christians. And it sounds like the Pharisees who used to beat their chest and talk about how great they are. I'm talking about humility and loving them. Really, model, Jesus modeled this. Before the rulers, he was silent before he went and was crucified because he knew there was a bigger picture, there was something else that needed to change, it silences the critics because they have nothing left to say when we treat them with love and respect, when we pray for them. Oftentimes, those who come against us have been hurt by the church and others in the church, or maybe they just see the church as their enemy. Why would we love those during that time? So God will be given the glory. I want you to look at a couple of verses that kind of speak to this that are outside of 1 Peter. And the first one is Proverbs 25. It says this, Proverbs 25, 21 and 22 says, If your enemies are hungry, give them food to eat. If they are thirsty, give them water to drink. You will heap burning coals of shame on their heads and the Lord will reward you. Well, what does that mean? Her heap burning coals of shame. What it's saying is that they're coming at us and they're just vehemently just tearing us down and we treat them with love and respect. They, don't, they have one or two choices to either back off and apologize or treat us differently or to walk away in shame and frustration because their actions aren't causing the reaction from us that they want. I've told the story before, years ago, the first church we ever worked in, there was a lady that played piano and, and Jennifer could play piano and we were really young, we were just married, just out of college, so like 23 and 21 and somebody asked Jennifer to come up and play on a Sunday morning and this lady, she was the piano player, she was older and she was, man, she just stared daggers at Jennifer, she treated her really cold like when Jennifer came in and could play, it was, it was like an element of jealousy. And Jennifer had recently read that scripture and decided, I'm going to put this into action. And so she started just loving on this lady, giving her a hug, just big smile every time she would see her. Eventually that broke that lady. And she warmed up to Jennifer and she's inviting her to come and sit beside her at the piano. It, it changed the relationship. Jennifer could have reacted and responded in the same way she was responded to and treated her cold and you know, kind of created this tension, but instead she chose to do what the scripture says, to love the one that was coming against her. And it changed the situation. That's not always going to be the outcome, but that's really the hope. Look what Jesus says about this in Matthew 5, 43 through 48. It says, you've heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you'll be acting as true children of the Father in heaven, for he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. He sends rain to the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, 
How are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect even as the Father in heaven is perfect. Now think about that. Now he's not talking about perfection and all this other stuff, but he's talking about loving that perfect love, even those that come against you. It changes to pray for them, to love them. We're to pray for people that are in authority. We're to pray for those that that come against us, that attacks us. It does two things. One, it opens up the doors of heaven. God does something supernatural there when we pray for our enemies. But two, it changes us. It's hard for us to have bitterness and anger and vengeance and all of those things towards somebody that's coming against us when we're praying for them sincerely out of the love of God. We're asking God to change our hearts as well as theirs. And it changes that situation. We silence those who come against us when we treat them with the love and respect of God. That's what it's talking about in silencing the foolish. We take away their power. We take away the power that their words have on us. It's a turning point. We show them the love of God. Not through preaching or condemning, but through our actions. That's why when we go and we, we put all these posts and say all these things about how God hates all of these things, that tears down the reputation of God instead of building somebody up. God is always about building somebody up. I love the way Mark Batterson puts it when he talks about National Community Church. He says, I want our church to be known for what, more for what it's for than what it's against. Yeah, there are actions in our society that we are not for, that we would adamantly be against. But we change the hearts of those that are around us by showing them the love and respect. Then we earn the opportunity to intelligently talk about the reasons why we disagree about some things, where we're at. And then it doesn't become about a fight. It becomes about respect and having the opportunity to to communicate that. So we don't have to defend ourselves. God will do that for us. We just have to follow Jesus' example. There's one final thing I want to touch on this. It doesn't really come through in 1 Peter, but I think it's appropriate to talk about when it comes to authority. There are cases and instances in Scripture where we do or are in a place to honor God and defy authority at the same time. And you're like, well, that just seems like there's a contradiction. No, I want you to understand this in context. Uh, I want to go all the way back to the book of Daniel. And there is a time when there were three young Hebrew guys that were taken into captivity. And King Nebuchadnezzar at that time had brought these Jewish guys, these young men, and made them, they were wise young men, and made them counselors and, and leaders in his group. He took these captives and basically made them servants, giving them some authority. But I want to show you, so this is in Daniel chapter 3. I don't want to take the time to read all of this. It's really the entire chapter, and it's like 30 verses. There's a lot there. But some of you guys may have heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were these Hebrew young men. They were wise. God used them. They were put in positions of authority. But now I'm going to look down at verse 10 of Daniel chapter 3. And I do want to read through some of this, but I want just for context. So King Nebuchadnezzar had made a decree. He had had this giant gold statue of himself built. And he made a decree that everyone, when the music was played and the song was done, that they were to bow down to worship the statue of him. Sounds like that emperor worship type stuff, right? The decree also states that those who didn't obey would be thrown into a fiery furnace, a blazing furnace. Now, verse 10, this is where it picks up. It says, You issued a decree requiring all the people bow down and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn, flute, zithers, lyre, harp, and pipes, and other musical instruments. That decree also states those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 
whom you have put in charge of the providence of Babylon, they pay no attention to you. Your majesty, they refuse to serve your gods, and they do not worship the gold statue you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue that I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you'll be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? And they replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. And because the king, in his anger, had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers that threw in the three men. They were securely tied and fell into the roaring flames. But suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, Didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men, unbound, walking around in the fire, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. Then Nebuchadnezzar came close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. And so they stepped out of the fire then the high officers, officials, governors, and advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads were singed, and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore I make this decree, if any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb, and their house will be turned into heaps of rubble. There is no other God who can rescue like this. Then the king promoted them to an even higher positions in the providence of Babylon. Here's what I want you to take away from this story. It's not so much that they defied the king, but the way they defied the king. Now think about that. They did defy the authority. And we were talking about respect and authority, but why did they defy? Because they were being asked to worship another god or a statue. And that went against their, their belief in God. That is the one time in Scripture, the only time in Scripture, that God gives us the right to defy that authority. Now God, at times, would raise up believers to fight against evil kings and rulers. That's a different story, and that's kind of the war side of things. There was war in Scripture. But the only time that we see that defiance, and when they defied him, they didn't yell, they didn't tear down, they didn't tell him why he's such an evil king. They just simply said, look, we're not going to bow down. Even when he said, who's going to save you? How are you going to get out of this? They're like, look, our God can save us. But even if he chooses not to, we're still not going to bow down. That's a hard, hard now. And what happened? God did rescue him. He could have chose not to, but he did. He rescued him. 
And we see that Nebuchadnezzar, it changed the heart of the ruler. He saw God for who he really was. Had they reacted differently, the outcome might have been different. We're to treat authority, even when that authority does something that we can't follow, we're still to treat it with respect. We're never to defy our God, but we are to treat authority with respect. For good or bad, there are rulers that have authority in our lives, but God has the ultimate authority. And we are to treat those that have authority over us with love and respect, the same way we're to treat our neighbors and our friends with love and respect. See, that's the bottom line, is that we are to follow the path of Jesus. Jesus did everything out of love and respect for the people around him. The only people that he opposed were the religious leaders that were tearing down the name of God, and he opposed them not to demean them, but to show them where they were missing in hopes that they would turn and follow God in the right way. So when it comes to authority, especially government authority, we need to treat it with love and respect. We need to be careful with our words. We need to use our words wisely. Our actions speak louder than anything else. And we need to love people, even if we disagree with them politically, even if they treat us poorly. We need to treat people with love. Remember, I talked about this last week. Our job, our mission, is to be disciples that make disciples. And the way that we do that is by showing them what it means to follow Jesus. More than preaching it, we need to show it in the way we live. We need to show the love of God. So when it comes to authority, it's the same thing. Treat all authority with the respect that it deserves. Pray for those that are in authority, whether we agree with them or not, pray for them. Pray for those that persecute you. Pray for your enemy. Let the love of God flow through you. So as we wrap up today, is there some bitterness in your heart towards an authority in your life? Is there some bitterness in your heart towards somebody that's come against you? Let's take the time and ask God to heal you of that and begin to pray for those in our lives that maybe have persecuted us or we struggle with and ask God to give us the grace and the mercy to be able to do those things. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for your love and grace, how you loved us even though we make mistakes, even though we're not perfect in this. Lord, we ask right now that you would give us the ability to pray over those that come against us. Lord, we pray right now for our president. We ask that you would lead and guide him. Lord, we pray right now for those that are in Congress and the House. And and Lord, we pray that you would lead and guide them. Father, for our state, we pray over our governor, we pray over our mayor, we pray over those that have authority in our lives, that they would follow you that their lives would be touched by you. And Lord, we pray that you would bless them right now. Lord, if we have bitterness in our hearts, heal us right now, forgive us right now. And help us to represent you well. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done in our lives. And we pray that you would do it in the lives of those that are over us today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for worshiping with us today. Again, if you have questions, if you're struggling with something, if you need prayer, please click that button. Allow our host to to pray with you and to share with you. We love you, and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hey, it's me again. Thanks for being with us online this morning. I hope you got something out of the service today and that you feel more connected than you did when you came in. Um, speaking of that, let me remind you the opportunities this week where you can get connected. Uh, Monday through Thursday on Zoom only, we have our 714 prayer time. 
Um, if you'd like to join us for that and you don't know how, just send a message to Pastor Larry and I or ask us right here on service. We'll get you there because we would love to have you join us in the mornings. Um, Wednesday evening is our women's Bible study from 6.30 to 8, and that is at Desktop, where we meet for church. Uh, we'll be meeting in Pastor Larry's office. Um, and then Thursday morning, we have our men's group that is meeting at 7.30 at Honeysuckle Biscuit and Bakery in downtown Kennesaw. And then Thursday evening, we have our youth monthly game night. And that will be from 6.30 to 8.30 at my house. Also, don't forget, Kennesaw Parks and Rec has a city event happening. The summer movie series is going on this coming Saturday. And that's from 6 to whenever the movie's done. Um, they start the movie at dark. There's lots of fun things to do from 6 till when the movie starts. So come on along, show up, and get to know people in this community. We love you guys. We're praying for you. And we want to see God do great things in your life. So join us again next week, and we'll see you then. Love you guys. Bye.